Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here today. My name is James Saryawini. I'm a software development engineer at AWS, and I work on Python tooling there. So some of the things I work on include Boto3, which is the AWS SDK for Python. I also work on the AWS CLI. And another project is AWS Chalice, which is a serverless micro framework for Python. And we just did a tutorial of that today, or earlier this week at EuroPython. And uh, there's a link that we tweeted out if you're interested. But I'm going to be using some of those projects that I work on as examples today throughout the talk. And I'm going to show you some techniques for debugging when some of the more traditional techniques like print statements and um, log statements don't really cut it. So at first you might think, is debugging really that important? Or I mean, how much time do we actually spend debugging? And I tried to find an answer to this. And it really depends on who you ask and what study you look at. I found one that was as high as 49.9% of our time we spend debugging, which seems pretty high to me. Uh, there is also another study that was um, 30 to 40% of our time is spent debugging. But what I would really say is I think that we spend more time than we expect debugging certainly the case for me. And there's also, there was an interesting study that I saw where they looked at novice computer science students and they were looking at how well they did in a course, which is what they considered a good programmer versus how well they did at debugging. And the interesting result there was that they weren't necessarily the same thing. So just because you were good at programming and got a good grade in the class didn't necessarily mean that you were good when specifically tested for debugging, although there was a much stronger correlation the other way. So my takeaway from this study is that debugging, while related to programming, is a separate skill that's worth studying and practicing and surveying the field to see what other techniques there are to make us more effective debuggers, because that will ultimately make us more efficient developers. So in other words, I think debugging matters. And when you look at the traditional forms of debugging, things that we've probably all done before, there's the print and trace style debugging, where you just annotate your source code with print statements and you put variables uh, and print out certain code paths you take. That's probably one of the things we do the most. I do that a lot. There's also the postmortem debugging, which we don't really do a whole lot of in Python. And then there's also interactive debugging. So if you're familiar with some area of the code and you know that part of the code is where your problem is, you can set a breakpoint or use a debugger built in in 3.7 or use a PyCharm debugger or whatever your IDE is and really step through your code and see exactly what's going on. So in this talk, what we're going to look at is some techniques <coughs> when print and trace debugging aren't enough. <clears throat> we'll look at some data visualization uh, of what our program is doing to help us get a better understanding of our code. And in that same study, one of the things they cited was that really a lot of the issues with debugging and one of the things that prevents people from being good debuggers is being able to get a mental model of what the code is doing. And so a lot of times you either don't have a mental model of how the code's supposed to work or your idea of how the code's supposed to work is actually wrong and that's the result of where a lot of bugs come from. And I think data visualization helps with that. It gives you a quick overview of what your code is doing and helps you troubleshoot faster. Now, I'm going to show you three visualizations. We're going to go from a fairly easy visualization and then just go in order of complexity. And for each one of these, I'm going to give you a real world example of where I use this technique to help try to troubleshoot a bug that I was working on. But some of the things to keep in mind is just like with log or print statements that you add to your code, it's not really meant for production code. So when you're done with it, you throw away the changes that you've made and hopefully you remove your print statements before you commit and push your code. And the visualizations as well, they're not meant to be perfect. Really the intent is just to help us figure out what's going on because the real goal is to fix the bug or to verify your design or some other thing other than the visualization. So with that in mind, there's a lot I want to show, so we're just going to jump into the diagrams here. So the first one, the simplest one, is a sequence diagram. And if you haven't seen it before, this is an example of what it looks like. You read it left to right, top to bottom. And in this example, there's two requests being made to a browser, and you can see that we send a request from one object to another, and then there's a second post where we send a request to the browser, to the web server, and then the ser web server sends a request to the database, and you get a response. And you can draw these by hand. You can draw them in Keynote or, or PowerPoint or Visio, whatever you use for your diagrams. But you can also generate these programmatically, or you can generate them by writing them out like this. So here you can create, this is a DSL for creating a sequence diagram. And the way this works is you, you can see it's the same diagram as before, but you have a browser with an arrow to the web server and an optional label, and then the same thing in reverse. And then the way you can render this, the tool that I like using is this tool called uh, seek diag, and you can just pip install it, and you'll get a command line utility that you can point it at this file, and then it generates a ping file that you can open up and see what this visualization is, which is this thing. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's the idea behind a, a sequence diagram. Let me give you an example of where that's helped out before. So, who here is familiar with Expect 100 Continue with HTTP? Okay, I, I certainly wasn't when I, until I started working on the SDK. But the idea behind Expect 100 Continue is instead of taking an entire HTTP request and response, what you do is you break it up into the headers and into the body. So you take your headers, you add an Expect 100 Continue header, and you send it to the server and you ask, what do you think about this request? And so the server takes it, looks it over and decides, is this the right host? Is this, do you have access? Maybe is the URI correct? Check the auth header if you want. And if everything looks good, it sends a 100 continue back, and then you can send the request body, and then you get your normal response. So the server can also send a 400 and say, you're not authorized to access this URI. It could also say the request looks good, but you have to send the request somewhere else and send you a redirect. And the reason this is helpful is if you have a large request body, you can avoid sending a large payload to a server that's just going to end up rejecting the request in the first place. So Expect 100 Continue is really useful, and we use it for when we do uploads to Amazon S3. The problem that we had was that HTTP lib requests in Eurolib 3, they don't support Expect 100 Continue, and there's not a clean way to add support to these libraries directly. And the last time I checked, I don't think requests in Eurolib 3 support it, and they didn't seem um, like it was a great idea to add directly to that library in the first place. So we decided to add it to our own code because we thought it was a useful enough functionality and it prevents a lot of issues, so it's good to have for us. But there was a bug. So. Occasionally, the expect 100 continue flow would return 500s, and that's normally fine. That'll go through our retry loop and, and eventually succeed. But some of the error responses weren't actually errors. And of course, like all hard bugs, it very rarely happened. There weren't a clear set of steps that demonstrated the issue. So we were trying to figure out what we could do. So the plan that I had was after trying the print statements and looking at log messages and not being able to figure it out, maybe we could generate a sequence diagram and see if there's any additional insight that we can gain. So the idea is we're going to annotate our source code when interesting messages are sent. We're going to generate that .diag file that we saw in the previous slides, and then we're going to generate an image from our diagram and see if anything stands out. So I'm going to be showing some code here. It's not necessarily, I wouldn't expect you to understand there's a lot of code. It's mostly just showing what we annotate so you can see the changes before and after. And so this is one of the classes we have. It's an AWS HTTP connection, and we're setting some stuff with the expect header, setting a flag calling the parent class, and then resetting the state. But the point here is that just, we noticed when you first start debugging, you add print statements. So you might start with something like this. And you say, okay, if the expect header is set, we're gonna add a print statement that said that, otherwise we're not gonna do that. But let's try to create a diagram from this. So we wanna generate a sequence diagram instead of using print statements. And you might think at first this is a lot of work, it's a lot of effort to do, but it's, it's really pretty straightforward. What I did was I created a debug.py module and you just drop it right in the root directory of your project. So we're gonna throw this away anyways. And we just have two functions here, add sequence and render sequence. And all it's really doing is just storing the string from the DSL that we saw before. So just where is the object coming from, and to, and an optional label, and then what direction the arrow goes. And just to show you how you can use this in a REPL, there's, not really, there's no magic to it. Just let's say we import debug because it's just in our root, the root uh, directory of a repository. If I create two objects, A and B, I can then say I'm going to add a sequence. So from A to B, where we say sending requests, and then from B to A, receiving response. And then if I call render sequence to dev standard out instead of a file name, you can see it generates a sequence diagram. Right? So, so far, pr pretty straightforward. And the way we add this to our code is that instead of the print statements we saw before, we just change them to these message things. And you notice the first line I'm doing is import debug, and then we just say message equals debug.add sequence, so I don't have to keep typing that over. But instead of print statements, it's just a little bit more structured. We're saying we're sending a message from ourself to self.host, and we're starting expect 100 continue. And I annotated that all throughout the source code. You're going to see a bunch of source code fly by here. The point, though, is if you see the green lines that are being added, they're just almost the same as what you do with a print statement with just a little bit more structure. And so I annotated the HTTP connection class, went into requests in Eurolib 3. And for the most part, we didn't really change any code. There's maybe one section, I think, right here where yeah, so there's a con or self.newcon, so request is trying to be fancy, and we just broke up the lines and said, let's grab the connection so that way we can call add sequence on it, but it's still the same logic. So for the most part, we're just doing a little bit more work than print statements. Now, this was doing add sequence. To do render sequence, we just have some driver script that shows an issue here. And so if you haven't seen uh, code that works with the AWS SDK, all we're doing is creating a client for S3 and then calling put object, so we're uploading something to S3. And I'm skipping ahead here just so that we can save time, but 
If we sleep for 60 seconds, it's an interesting question what should happen because you'll have an idle connect timeout so the server should maybe close the connection because you're not doing anything. And then we make another put object request, what should happen? And so we let that go and then we call debug.render sequence and then we generate a sequence diagram. And so this is what we actually get. And we'll zoom in in a second. I just like seeing the shape of the diagram at first. And I want to stress this is from real data. So this isn't uh, you know, drawn by hand or anything. This is just running our code with that script and then looking at the sequence diagram. And this is what we get. So zooming in here, if you've used requests before, you know under the hood it uses urllib3, which has a connection pool. And so we see that the first thing we do is check out a connection from the connection pool. And it's the first time we've created it. So we create this underscore socket object, which is just a socket. And it returns it back. And then just like we saw on our slide, we're going to start the expect 100 continue flow. That was the first message statement we saw on the slides. So it goes through this. And you can see the diagram is not perfect, but you get the idea. It's sending headers. We wait for the 100 continue response. And you can see it's sending it to my bucket name, so .s3 US West 2 Amazon AWS.com. And then after that, it's going to send um, the body once we get a 100 continue. And we get a 200 OK, and then we put the connection back. And then at this point, we're sleeping for 60 seconds, right? And then we want to see what happens when we create a new request. So we do the same thing again. We call get connection. We create a connection here. And then we go through the same flow that we're going to skip. It's the same as before. We send the headers, wait for the response, and then send the body. But the key insight here, the thing that, that stood out once this diagram was generated, showed a difference in how I thought the connection pooling worked, which is that you have a single connection instance but you have multiple socket objects. So the lifetimes aren't the same. So if a connection closes, what we do is instead of creating a brand new HTTP connection object, we instead create a new socket object and associate it with the existing uh, connection instance. Comparing that to if we're reusing the same socket, if we just continually make requests and we don't sleep, this is, the, this is the diagram that we'd see. And so now that we know the lifetimes are different, after all this analysis, the fix is pretty straightforward. It's just when you close the connection, you have to reset the extra state that we added, which is a little bit different from, say, the file API. So if you close a file, there's not really an expectation you're going to open that same exact file object later. It's, you would just create a new file object. So it was a little bit different. But once we were able to get that insight that we're reusing the same connection instance, even when it's closed, it was much easier to track down the bug. And so we won't have time to dig into the, the details of exactly how that worked. But essentially, the connection was in a bad state. We assumed it was a terminal failure state, and we didn't reset our state appropriately. So that was the first visualization. It was really straightforward to add with sequence diagram because it did all the heavy lifting of generating the diagram. Now we're going to look at the second one. This is the second of the third one. And it's visualizing internal state. And we do this a lot. This is probably the technique that I use the most. And the idea is that as things are happening in your code, you just log whatever the internal state of some object is, and you can generate these interesting graphs. So to, again, give a use case where we tried to, where this was really, really helpful, we're going to try to download a file. It's, it seems like it's a pretty straightforward thing to do at first. And so <clears throat> if you wanted to download, say, a video file or something, the easiest way you would do it, assuming it's big enough where you can't just hold the whole thing in memory, say it's 100 gigabytes or something, right? So what you would do is you would take the first chunk, and you would download a file and maybe just write it to your local file. And then you take the next chunk of the remote file, download it, write it, and you keep going. And eventually, you would have the entire file downloaded. right? And that works. And that's pretty straightforward. But what we do in the CLI is we take the file and then conceptually we break it into chunks. And for each chunk, we then have a thread, a thread pool that's assigned to individual chunks of the file. And they download the file in parallel. And so whenever they're downloading a file, the writes can come out of order. And we just seek to wherever the offset is in the file and then write out the data. And so at some point in time, your file could look like this. It, there's just whatever data we have downloaded, we just write it out to that location. And, but eventually, you will get your entire, your entire file written just the same as we've done it sequentially. And if we actually look at data here that plots the IO writes, this is using matplotlib. These are the sequential, this is actual data writing um, where the S3 writes are happening within the file. And so we just took the file and shifted it vertically. So the bottom of the file, the beginning of the file is y equals 0. And then the y max is the end of the file. And you can see each thread is writing at the same time to different parts of the file. And so you can see how this kind of parallelism um, can give a nice uh, boost in performance sometimes. But that, and that itself is pretty, pretty non-trivial to write. But we wanted to, there was an interesting use case we had where we wanted to download to a non-seekable stream. I should ask, has anyone used the AWS CLI before? OK, cool. So um, this is a CP command. This is what we're downloading from a bucket and uh, to standard out. 
And so that way we can just pipe it to say gun zip and then pipe it somewhere else and send the data and we don't need to have a local buffer. So if you have a large, say, I don't know, 500 gigabyte file or something, you don't need 500 gigabytes of temporary storage to download the file to, you can stream it directly to a pipe. So the problem that we had was that here you can't do this because you have to write data sequentially, right? You can't, there's no seek on, on the pipe. So one thing you could do is you could just stream it, just like we were doing before, and very early versions of the AWS CLI did that, but we wanted to see if there was something better we could do, because let's still assume that downloading is a bottleneck, that writing to disk locally is much faster than downloading remotely. So the initial idea that we had, that we implemented, was let's just have a buffer, right? And so when you're, and you do the same thing with your thread pools, but instead, all you're gonna do is hold on to it in memory. And if it's not the next contiguous block, you just keep buffering it. And then eventually, once that buffer comes along and you now have a contiguous range, you can then take that and flush it to disk, right? So there was a problem with this. We implemented this, it worked. And during development, we noticed that there was a pretty big problem, which is in the worst case, you buffer the whole file, right? So if you're waiting on one chunk of the file, and you know, networks are, are lossy, networks have congestion, sometimes things come out of order. And so if you're waiting on one part, you could potentially buffer you know, a 500 gigabyte file in memory. So we wanted to fix this, and we tried to figure out what would be the best way to fix this without any huge performance hit. So what we ended up implementing, I, I did this sliding window algorithm, which is very similar to what TCP does, if you're familiar with that, and you just limit the range of what your file can download to. So the way this works is, while you have parts that are downloading, you only allow them to download from that range. And it's not until something on the left side of the window comes in that it then unlocks that contiguous range. And so you take that, you flush it out to disk or whatever your pipe is, and then that moves over and the window slides over, and then that's the new part you can download, and that's your new max. So that was the sliding window. And we're not gonna look at the, the code. It gets a little more involved because there's threads and you have to have semaphores and, and the appropriate locks. But essentially there's an acquire, which is on the right-hand side of the window, and then there's a release. And if the release is on the left side of the window, the window slides. And again, th the point here is I wanted to show you the green highlights, which is how we annotated the source code to be able to verify that this algorithm was working how we wanted. And we'll look at what the T function is in a second, but for the acquire, there's only one trace that we were interested in. And then for the release, there was three parts that we talked about. So one is if I try to release something in the middle of the window, then we just put it in a buffer. And if I release something that's on the left side of the window, then I can start flushing the buffer. And then potentially there's a chain reaction, because once I unlock something on the left-hand side, any other contiguous range can then be now released. So there's three events there. And again, the thing is, um, all this function is doing is just printing some internal state. So it's printing the sequence number, so where in the window we are, and it's printing the time, and then whether or not it was an immediate release or a chain release, but just basically internal state. And all this is doing is using the logging module. So we have this tag tracer that's just a, a quick shorthand so that we can dump structured data using JSON, and then we just have this T function again because we just want something really quick to add to our code. But Ultimately, what you get is this. You get log messages that say the time, the thread, and then a JSON payload. And then we can take that and parse it and then generate plots over time of our internal state to see what's happening. And what we want to see is a sequential, because we have to write it, so we have to write it in order. We should see something that starts from the bottom left and, and goes up to the right. Unlike the threads, uh, the diagram we saw where we had multiple S3 um, writers going at the same time. So this is what the actual plot looks like, and we'll zoom in in the details in a second, but you can see visually, at least, this is a good confirmation that our algorithm is working how we want. I mean, we had unit tests and functional tests and integration tests, so we knew it was working, but in terms of the behavior, was this more or less what we expected, some sort of linear kind of um, up and to the right behavior? And if we zoom in a little bit, uh, this was, these are the four uh, trace events that we added that we saw in the previous slides. The acquire, which is the blue one, and then the three releases. And we'll pick a specific event and walk through it, but let's say that here the release always happens sequentially, but if something wants to be released, and we'll pick this data point here, so the release is requested, but it's not ready yet, we aren't able to release it until we just trace along that, um, the same Y value. That's when the release occurs, but it only happened with, this is the delay, it only happened because that black dot there was what we were waiting for. So that's the left side of the window. And you can see immediately above that, the reds, those were the chain reaction, those are the, the other things that could be released because they were just pending. And then immediately after that, you see the blue dots can immediately acquire the next part of the file, and that's the sliding window in action. So this was a good visualization for us to verify that yes, this is in fact the correct mental model, this is how it's working, it does seem to be working how we expect. 
And we could look at different window sizes. So the previous graph was window size of 10. This is a window size of 100. And the, really, the only trade-off you're making is just you can potentially stall and have a bigger buffer size, right? So here, um, I think the window size is 100, and it looks like the stall is maybe 50 slots. So as long as we're OK with a stall of 100, then this is a decent window size. But as we start to look at bigger window sizes, you can see the total time doesn't really change. You're just buffering more memory. So you don't really gain a whole lot from having a bigger window size. So the takeaway here was by generating log statements that just graph internal stage, you can then parse them and start to create really interesting plots to verify the behavior of your algorithms to make sure they're doing what you expect, make sure you have the correct mental model. So the third one that we're going to look at is creating a custom diagram. So so far, we've been really leveraging other tools to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So matplotlib for us, and then we also use seekdiag. But there's sometimes when you have some sort of visualization in mind and no existing tools really creating exactly what you want. So for this, we're going to generate our own custom diagram. And to keep with using the CLIs, we don't have to explain new concepts. We're going to look at uploads now. So there was a problem very, very early on. I think this was version like 1.0 five years ago, so it's more, it's not really that interesting anymore, but it's interesting in terms of the visualization, because this has long been fixed. But there was a case where there was a high CPU usage, so the thing would work, but it seemed like it was consuming unnecessary CPU usage, and we were trying to figure out what caused it. And the way that uploads work is similar to downloads, there's a producer-consumer pattern, and you would take something from the queue, so you'd have a worker thread, pull something from a queue, and then in some interesting cases, it would take work from the queue, the worker throw to look at it and decide it can't do anything with it, so it put it back on the queue. And then there would be times where we thought it was just cycling. So it would take something from the queue, look at it, decide it can't do anything, put it back, take another task, decide it can't do it, and put it back, and it would just keep spinning like that. And here's, here's what the actual worker thread looks like. It's, it looks like a lot of code, but the gist is grab something from the queue, which is going to be a reference to a function, and if we can call it, invoke it, put it on the result queue, and if not, we put it back. And all I'm doing here, there's these log.debug statements. And instead of internal state, we're just logging when certain events happen. So we're interested, when do we get a queue? Uh, when do we get an event from a queue? When, does the, when do we start to invoke it? When is it finished? When do we put it back? So that's that queue put back in the middle there. And really, again, this is the main takeaway, just the things that we highlighted. It's maybe five, six lines of code. And we're just emitting when certain events happen. And so the way that we parse this is we have a log file here that just has various number of events. But even looking at this, it's kind of hard to tell. Because if you notice, there's a bunch of threads here. There's thread 2 to thread 7. And it's calling get at certain points. And it's really hard to see the state transitions or the, the state diagram here. And so we wanted some sort of visualization to help confirm some of the suspicions we had. So what we do, take the timestamp, the thread, and the message. And we put that in a name tuple. So we go through each line and parse those out just by splitting on the hyphens. And then from there, we group them by threads, because we want to see a visualization of each thread at each time. And so we have things like, what time did it start? What time did it end? And then based on the actual, if it's an invoke start or invoke multi-start, we pick the event type. And then once we have that, we're ready to generate our image. And I know that went really fast, because the thing I want to focus on is just how to use Pillow, which is what I use to generate the image. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a fork of the Python imaging library. When I had used it before, I would really only thought it could do image resizing, generating thumbnails, you know, rotations and cropping, that kind of stuff. But there's, I think it's almost a hidden module. There's an image draw module where you can, it has primitives for drawing lines and rectangles and circles and basic shapes, and you can generate an image from scratch. And so that's what I did here. And there's a lot of code here, and, and the slides will be available online, but there's really just four steps. We go through each thread. And we figure out what color. We're just drawing a bunch of rectangles. We figure out what color to make the rectangle based on the event type. So if it's this put back thing where you have a worker thread taking something from the queue and then immediately putting it back, we'll color that red so it stands out. And then otherwise, we draw a rectangle. And the width of it is just based on that end minus the start timestamp so we know how long it took. And then at the end, we just call image.save, which saves the image to a file. And that's going to generate a visualization for us. So if we look at that, this is what we get. And the way we read this is left to right for time. And then each row represents a thread. So we can see what the thread is doing at each point in time. And there's the legend there on the right. So we can see the gray is the non-multipart upload, the black is a multipart, and the red is a putback. And if that's, if that's a little hard to follow, the, the main thing we're interested in is the red part, because that's the part we think might be having issues. So just zooming in here, like this is a multipart upload with the black part. 
the gray part, upload part, and then the red is that put back part. So what's nice about this diagram is if you take a vertical line and just trace it, you can see what each thread is doing at a given point in time, right? And so you can see how many multi-part uploads are happening at any given point in time. For historical reasons, we had a limit of three, which you can't get into, but that was an interesting uh, visual confirmation of that. You can only see it's always touching three black rectangles. But, oh. <laughs> um, okay. But if we zoom in here, at least you can see these small, these small um, red squares here, which are the putback things. That was the part where we could clearly see that there's at one point one, two, three, four, five, six threads that were just spinning on the CPU. So it was taking something from a task, putting it back, and then continually doing that. And this diagram, it's pretty short. But there were also times where other diagrams that I don't have anymore where it was showing much longer spin cycles. And so it was very easy to visually verify at a given point in time, here's what all the threads are doing, and they are potentially using a lot of CPU. And the, the main takeaway from this, which I know we went pretty fast through, was just that we can use Pillow based on some state events that we emit to generate our own custom diagrams. And it's maybe 10, 15 lines of code to do that. OK, so wrapping up, there was three diagrams we looked at. We looked at sequence diagram. That was showing us the flow of messages between objects. And we can use the seek diag tool to generate those for us. We also use matplotlib to graph internal state. And that was where we just have periodically throughout time just flushing a JSON document that has all the internal state of our object we're interested in. And then we can generate visualizations and, and time series plots from that. And then finally, when none of those work, we can use Pillow and have access to basic primitive shapes to draw visualizations based on the example I used, which was uh, events happening. So hopefully, the next time you're debugging and you can't figure out why your code isn't working and all the traditional means haven't worked, maybe give one of these a try, and maybe it'll work for you. I know this stuff has been really helpful for me throughout the years, and I hope it's equally as helpful to you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. So uh, we have time for a few questions. Um, anybody wants to come here to the microphone, please? No? So then I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, have you considered using uh, like uh, vector uh, representations of those, uh, the, the, the last type of diagram, for example? To, to be able to maybe integrate more text and like zoom it in, keep the... Um, oh, yeah. Um, I have not considered it, but that's definitely something that, I don't, I don't know how much more involved that's going to make the generation, but, but yeah, I think that's kind of why, with a lot of these, it's whatever is the first thing we can get that'll generate a visualization that gets us pretty close. But I think, yeah, if we're gonna put this in, you know, um, a blog post or documentation or something, we'd look at creating an actual vector image and, and cleaning it up, definitely. Yeah, great talk, thanks. Uh, just a small question. When you test this code, you test it in production or in a test environment? Because you don't want to put your code, you know, to the repository, mm -hmm. you said, so. What do you do for the actual testing part? Yep, so for the testing part, it's usually not in production. It's usually on some sort of test environment that we try to, and a lot, sometimes for these code, especially the ones that run a long time, we'll have to leave it running, you know, sometimes for a day or overnight or something because it takes a while for the bug to reproduce. So you generate a lot of data. Um, and I think the other thing that's a little bit different here is because these are client-side libraries, it's a, a little bit different from, say, a web application where you have, like, a prod stage and a dev stage where, you know, with client libraries, it's, it's not, quite analogous. Yeah, I guess you have a you have a server that is only designated for tests and Yeah, you could do that. So if this was for a web app, you could also have, you know, a percentage of your a small percentage of your traffic redirected to these test machines as well, or these machines that have a little bit more intense monitoring on it. Yeah. Okay. Other questions maybe? So yeah. Sorry to guess um, I will ask a very general question because I were really uh, problematic. Uh, I want to I want to learn uh, learn something and take take from take away to apply my code debugging. What's your suggestion? Or because that gentleman mentioned that you don't uh, you you won't definitely you want to check out in the uh, report, right? Mm -hmm. So so what, what we can do or 
What's your suggestion? So I think one would be if you do have a test environment or you have ability to shift the percentage of traffic, you could do this. Um, the other thing, though, is that a lot of the stuff that I showed doesn't have a whole lot of overhead. It's mostly just we didn't want the cognitive overhead of seeing what are these trace things in the code. But I think just like refactoring code, if you do something and then you do it again, and then definitely if you do it a third time, you think, you know, maybe if we keep doing this, it's worth putting in proper, you know, code in there to do these traces. And for a lot of these things, you know, we fixed the issue, we verified the issue, and we haven't had to come back to them. But I think if we kept doing that, then yeah, we would try to actually clean it up and just keep it in the production code base. And with the logging module, you know, you can set the log level high enough where you're not actually emitting debug, and it's only if you turn on the appropriate log level that you would see um, these traces get emitted. Thank you again, James. Thanks.